Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I am back at you with another viewer request video where I'm gonna show you how you can build an Airflow pipeline to extract data from a Postgres database, kick off a Spark job that's going to do some heavyweight transformations of that data, and then take that new transformed data and store it in a mini IO bucket. I'm also going to show you how you can set up a mini IO bucket and run Spark locally as well um, so that you can have everything in one self-contained environment, which is what uh, my man who requested this in the comments uh, wanted. So that's what I got for you today. Um, and we're going to start this video just by actually setting up a fresh new Airflow environment because we're going to need to customize this Airflow environment with the Docker Compose override file to install and provision a mini IO instance alongside our Airflow environment when we spin it up. Um, so what I'm going to do is first cd into my data guy video repos folder and then make directory, call it uh, spark mini io, cd in there, and then astro dev init, and this will just build me a basic Airflow directory with everything I need to get started running Airflow using Docker. Um, so here, going into data guy video repos, spark me IO, open this up. And then what we're also going to need to do here is add a new file called our Docker Compose override. So what this allow, will allow us to do is actually have uh, additional services spun up alongside our uh, just core Airflow environment that we're spinning up using Docker from this Docker file here. Um, so we'll just call this docker compose.yaml and make sure you call it exactly this so Docker knows where to look. And then you're going to want to provision the service, mini IO latest. Um, here you can see the uh, image there. And then let's just use a version 3.4. Um, and yeah, so this is going to essentially, when we activate and spin up our Airflow environment, it's also going to spin up and activate a mini IO database running on ports 9090 as part of that stack. Um, and then for actually installing uh, Spark, all you need to do is add PySpark to your requirements file. Um, and so what this will do is download PySpark uh, and then install it into our environment. And then what we can do is use PySpark to create and execute uh, a Spark environment. Um, so probably not the best practice for production, but I wanted to show you kind of a lightweight, easy way you can use um, to just run it on your machine locally without needing to fuss around with the whole uh, Spark install process on, on an actual cluster. So this is more of a format you'd want to use for you know, testing rather than something you'd want to use um, actually in production. And then what we're also going to need is a Spark submit operator. Um, so we are going to bring in uh, the Spark provider. So what we'll do is add that here. So it's requirements text file, you can think of it as just analogous to a pip install for all of these packages. So we're installing uh, the Spark provider package, and then we will also need to install the Postgres provider package. So here, use provider, install, delete the pip install part of it, and boom. Now we have our Spark and Postgres providers ready to be used in our DAG, and we're ready to get started building our DAG. So to do that, open up the DAG folder, create a new Python file, spark mini.py, and then we will get started as we do with all of our Airflow DAGs by importing a whole series of packages. Um, so here we are, make sure it's all the right stuff. Uh, we are going to import all of these packages. And so first, Airflow DAG, obviously need that. Task decorator, so we can use the Taskful API and define our Python steps more easily. Days ago, which is just a utility that kind of works with Airflow's funky date time system to allow you to say, hey, look at something that's X days ago. Uh, then we also have the Spark submit operator for actually submitting and triggering a Spark job. Um, and then here you also have your Postgres hook, uh, which is how we're going to interact, get that data out of that Postgres database and then make it available to be transformed uh, by that Spark job. And then also importing mini IO. And actually one sec, let me also, you will also need to import mini IO into here under the provider packages, or no, actually you don't need to do that. Sorry, yeah. You don't need to do that because we're installing mini IO in the environment. So it'll, because it's spinning up alongside this Docker post, but let's just add the IO here just in case. Um, and then importing pandas as PD. So pandas obviously going to need this um, to manipulate data and create data frames. IO, this is for interacting with kind of logging systems and 
uh, also just provides a little bit of a uh, IO, essentially it's like a file buffer. So instead of you needing to have like an actual uh, space in your computer available for it and you know, taking a file, saving it to your computer and then uh, you know, bringing it back out, what IO does is kind of act as like a temporary storage space alongside your Airflow environment. And then logging for you know, just monitoring, pushing stuff to logs, uh, being able to create custom logging messages for better error handling uh, when something goes wrong and we need to actually fix it. Then what we're going to do is import the default arg, so owner, airflow, depends on past, email failure, email and retry. Um, and then I also want to show you how you can in initialize the mini IO client here. So here, what we're going to do is initialize a connection to our mini IO instance. Um, so using Minio, um, here we have just our port that we're running it on, so port 9000, which we're actually running on 9090. And then you, whatever, if you wanted to find an access key, secret key, add those here as well. Um, doesn't necessarily need to be secure because it's just on a local machine, but this is how you can define and initialize that Minio client, which we're then going to use later in the DAG to actually connect to Minio. Speaking of the DAG, now it's time to actually define the name of the DAG. Um, we'll call this, you know, expanded Spark ETL Minio DAG, um, and this is just going to be, you know, pretty default or default default args. You know, no scheduling interval, start date just one day ago, and no catch up, so it'll just start running uh, as if it was a previous day whenever we trigger it. So now that we have the basic outline ready to go. Let's go and build our first task. So. As I said before, our first task is going to be extracting data from that Postgres database. So here we're just going to use the Taskflow API, define an extract task, use that Postgres hook, um, and then we have our SQL statement here. If you want to have a more complex SQL statement, I would recommend including the SQL statement as a script within this include directory, and then referencing that script here. Um, because obviously you don't want to have just all of your SQL statements hard-coded into your DAGs. Um, Number one, just for maintainability, but also like if you need, if you're using the same SQL statement across many DAGs, and you need to update it for you know a new table name, this allows you or having it as a script allows you to update it in one location rather than you need to go into every single DAG, figure out which ones use it, and then change that one as well. Um, then our data frame is going to be uh, using that PG hook, get the pandas data frame that's generated by this SQL statement. So. First step is getting the uh, SQL, or you executing the SQL statement, returning that raw data, and then get pandas data frame is what's actually going to be converting it into a pandas data frame and saving it as a data frame here. Then we're just gonna have some logging info here, publishing the amount of rows from the source database that we're sending into our logging files, um, so that we just have a quick, easy way to look at in the logs, hey, how many uh, file, or how many rows did the, was this data generated with? Um, and that's also really crucial for, hey, you want to check consistency over time. Um, make sure that, hey, this rows isn't, you know, it doesn't go from 10,000 rows a day down to like 10. Uh, just an easy, quick way of, of figuring out errors. Then our next task is going to just be doing some light transformations. So here, um, in this case, what we're going to do is, in, you know, you can have any transformations you want here, but the end of it just need to create a CSV path and then save that data frame to a CSV here. Uh, use index false because it'll create its own uh, index in that CSV. And then you have, you know, your log info telling you what path it was saved to. It doesn't really matter. Um, that's why I have the 10th path here because you're not going to, you don't want, I mean, you don't need this data to persist and you don't really probably want this data to persist because it'll just clog up uh, or persist as a CSV file here. This is really just an intermediary location uh, that we're going to save it in before, you know, we keep going uh, on to the next step where we're actually going to save it in that mini IO environment. Then, so, our next job is consuming that data that's living at that CSV, and then you tr triggering a Spark job uh, to process that data. So here we have our task ID, Spark Transform, and then application is the path to your Spark job. So here is where you're actually going to want to include the Spark job you're going to run in here. So let's say you know it's SparkJob.py uh, or just Spark.py. What you would do is you would have or you have Spark path to um, and then include directory. And then this will, when, once you spin it up, it'll make that Spark script accessible to that live environment uh, so that you, you can execute that. And because you have Spark set up running alongside your environment, you can just have that point to your local host um, and your connection ID. Then application arguments, so input data, transform data, just giving it a location to pull from and a location to uh, export its completed and transformed data set to. So next step we're gonna have here and our final one is actually loading now our transformed data into a mini IO 
uh, environment. So here we have a task load, which is just going to pull from that transform CSV path, so the one we referenced up here, and that's parks and min operator. Then we have that data frame that's transformed, so reading that CSV, bringing it back in a data frame format, then taking that transform data frame and again putting it as a CSV, um, but then putting that object um, and the object name here, you know, output uh, slash transform CSV here, uh, is going to be stored into that mini IO environment that we spun up alongside your Airflow environment. Um, and you can point to the data, so this is where that IO bytes IO comes in. So when we're saving that CSV, it's actually going uh, to that bytes IO uh, kind of intermediary source location before it's actually uploaded into the mini IO client. And then here, just telling it what length it is with a simple len operation and telling it also which content type it is. So we know that it's a CSV and it'll be imported properly as a, C as a CSV file type. So now our data doesn't get screwed up. Then the last steps are just defining the task dependencies. So here it's pretty simple, just linear task, you know, the most bog standard extract, transform and load uh, pipeline you could have. That's really it. Uh, pretty simple use case, but I just wanted to whip this together for my commenter that wanted it. And uh, I hope it helps someone else out there just figure out a path to take some data, transform it to Spark, and then toss it in a mini IO bucket. Um, but that's all I got for you today. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you have a good one. Data guy out.